Hi everyone, so today I have Gabe White. For those who uh, doesn't know, Gabe is one of the, probably the only master shooter in uh, USPSA that shoots always from appendix. And he's uh, also known on YouTube as Origami AK with his training videos and because of his school gabewhitetraining.com, uh, which is pretty widely known in CCW community. So we're here today at Area 1 2019 in uh, Oregon. Bend, Oregon, and I thought we will do this interview uh, not really about technical stuff, but more about ideally cultural, and we're gonna call it feels over reels, but uh, sarcastically. All right, so what do we start with? How did you start shooting? Well, like many people, I've been shooting since I was a little kid, but I didn't become very skilled until much later. Uh, I kind of did the basic, you know, basic marksmanship, safe shooting thing. Uh, and was taught taught that a, a, as a kid, but uh, training didn't really start until I was right about when I was 21, and I started right away with handgun, and I got into a little bit of training, but you know, being 21, you don't have a lot of money, and uh, so I didn't didn't really do much training until uh, a bit later. Uh, did a little bit to start with, and then uh, continued continued training in my later 20s and, and uh, throughout my 30s, and uh, I was very very fortunate to just happen into some good training to start with at the time and certainly training is very widely available now including lots of great training uh, but at the time it wasn't nearly as widely available and I'm sure I could have found another path that wouldn't have been as good so I was I was very fortunate to have some good trainers in schools right away. When did you start carrying it? What was your first carry gun? <laughs> when I was 21 uh, and uh, my first carry gun, first handgun I bought was a Ruger P95 DC. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's a double action, single action Ruger of the Ruger P series. Uh, it's it's not a bad gun. It's kind of size inefficient, but other than that, it was at least durable and reliable. And it was, you know, it was a. I could have made a lot worse choices to start out with. Okay. So you start carrying right away, and when did you start shooting USPSA? Well, USPSA came far later. So I started out training a little bit in my early 20s, a lot more in my late 20s and early 30s. And right about then, after I was a, a few years deep into uh, a much greater frequency and quantity of, of tactical training, uh, eventually I started to become aware of the kind of technical performance levels that existed in what are recognized as upper class competitors in the competitive shooting world. So think, you know, ballpark, master grand, master level shooting. And uh, I thought of how awesome it would be to be able to produce that level of performance, you know, performance in terms of hits and time and gun handling. Uh, but with what I really walked around with on a daily basis. And that's when I really started to go on a technical skills tear and uh, use, use the wisdom that exists in the competition shooting community to, to work on technical skills improvement. And uh, really just drive drive that skill level a lot, uh, grind it down and drive it a lot harder, uh, but sticking to using my carry here from concealment. And, you know, there's kind of a, a flip side to that. I mean, I, I don't make it nearly, when, when you say carry here from concealment, for a lot of people that means a, a big compromise in, in gun and capability and round count and stuff like that. And, I, and I've always gone the, the opposite direction. I mean, I, I carry the, the, the most capable roughly speaking, most capable gun I could figure out how to carry or something in that ballpark. So, I mean, I'm carrying around, you know, a Glock 17 with lots of rounds in it, so it's not like, it's not like I'm trying to do what I'm doing with, you know, Glock 43 or, uh, you know, a gun that it's going to be a lot more challenging. So now you're carrying 17? Mm -hmm. And today you're shooting 17? Yes. Okay, but before, weren't you shooting 34? Yeah, I've been shooting a Gen 3 34 for about eight years or so, and I love those guns. Those guns are great, but I was shooting for about eight years, and I just had to change something a little bit. I didn't want to switch to a complete other gun, but something had to just refocus my attention just a little bit and uh, switch from a Gen 3 34 to a Gen 5 17. Kind of did that, and uh, just been, been running with that since then. I, I really like both those guns. They're both great. Okay, so what was your motivation to start carrying and then start competing? It's like, why? Well, why carry uh, is a, a question that the, the answer comes from the time I was a small child. And it was just always very apparent to me that uh, the, the first right and responsibility of every living thing is to attempt to continue its existence. And self-defense is absolutely essential to that. Uh, I, I personally believe that self-defense and the 
carriage of the tools attendant to that right is the most fundamental human right from which all other human rights are derived. I mean, if you recognize any other thing as a right, whatever that is, whether it's things enumerated in the Bill of Rights or other things that may not be enumerated in the Bill of Rights, but you consider them to be a right, whatever those things are, you've got to be alive first, as far as I can tell. And so it's, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's the root of all human rights. That's, that's an interesting way to, to look at this. Yeah, basically self-preservation and uh, continuation yes. of, of its own self. Okay, so how did you first hear about USPSA and why did you start your meeting? Well, USPSA, uh, I, d I don't think I even knew of its existence when I was in my early 20s, but in my late 20s and early 30s as I started uh, getting a lot more heavily into tactical training, I think I was at least dimly aware that it existed. I don't think I really knew much about it. And I was, I was at the time, mildly infected with the competition will get you killed in the streets thing. Uh, and it took it took a couple of years to see see past that and see through it. I was really, I'm really glad. I'm glad that I, I'm just glad that I saw the light at all. Never mind uh, as early as I could have. I would love it if I had started shooting USPSA in my early 20s, but you know it didn't happen that way, so that's okay. Uh, the motivation to shoot USPSA is that I could see that it was, it was a different type of. Whatever you want to call it, training, practice, testing. It was a different shooting activity than the other things that I did. And really, it's, it is, I think, it's just the example of, of seeing the, 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 the actual. Once I started to become more familiar with, say, okay, what did this hits in time mean in terms of skill level as I progressed through tactical training? I kind of was semi aware of my own level of skill. I you know, got out of timer and used that a little bit. And I was somewhat aware of some of those things. And then when you look at the comparison from, from that to what upper class competitive shooters throw down in terms of hits of time, I wanted to have that too. It was really that simple. And uh, I think that uh, I, I've always just liked carrying a very capable gun. I, I really want the most overall capability that I can have. And that's kind of a combination, that's a combination of skill and equipment. And uh, so I just wanted to drive my skill level much, much, much harder. Uh, at some point, you know, I, I would say that I started out training for self-defense, but at some point, you have any likely and even some unlikely self-defense bases, you start to get those reasonably covered and you just start going, you, you keep doing it because you love it, or at least that's why I keep yeah. doing it. I keep doing it because I love it. Bottom line is, it becomes a martial art and I'm just practicing it as a martial art. It's really wow. that simple. This is very close to what I would say. This is really cool. Um, well, that's probably why we're here running a very, very similar gun, <laughs> you know, gun and rig and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember your mindset when you were still in the get killed in the streets camp? Uh, I was never very heavily in that camp. I think I had been been probably cautioned against it at some point by somebody or another, and kind of absorbed a little bit of that idea. Um, when you're in that place. So we could go back to a, a, a conceptual framework that comes from the, the tactical world and I think has a lot of value. You've got mindset, tactics, skills, and people. Yeah, and, and they get divided different ways depending on you know who's talking. But you know, let's just go with mindset, and tactics, skills for the moment. Uh, quite proper, and I'll say that quite properly. The tactical world focuses on the larger stuff that occurs at the front end, and if done well has the largest effect on the outcome of the situation with the least involvement by the person. So here's what I mean by that. Awareness, mindset, biggest thing. Whatever you think you're going to do about the problem, you're going to shoot it, you're going to stab it, you're going to you know, choke it out, you're going to punch it, you're going to run away from it or pepper spray it, or whatever you think you're going to do to solve the problem, you, you've got to be aware of it first. You've got to be aware of it in time to, uh, with enough margin to employ that solution uh, or create the opportunity and then we're into a lot hairier thing. And so I think quite properly the self-defense world focuses on awareness, mindset, seeing the problem coming in time and when it's time and, and so, that, so that you can avoid it, you can employ good tactics, create distance, use barriers, defensive body language and verbalization and try to defuse, de-escalate, get away, all those things. Those are things that keep it from becoming a shooting. And then if those things don't work, or maybe you just didn't have the opportunity to employ those in the first place because sometimes you get caught unaware, that's just how it works, sometimes the other guy did a really good job with their criminal tactics and worked you and painted you into a corner so that by the time you were aware of it, and of course you want to be aware of that stuff so that you can start to short circuit it earlier, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen that way. And if they get you painted into a corner, it can come down to small, small margins, execution of skill, and so those things can be meaningful too. And ultimately... You know, you, 
to, to kind of bring skill and tactics together, you know, you, you want to have a deep well of skill so that when the tax man of reality shows up and takes a lot of your stuff away, because reality is hard and real life is hard and there's chaos and there's stress and, and uh, all the human performance difficulties that go along with all that stuff, you know, when when that happens, you want to have a deep enough a, a well of skill, deep enough an account, an account of skill that you can pay the tax man and you still have enough left to, to do what needs to be done to save your life or somebody else's. And so you want to have that. You also want to have that because you can't always adjust the circumstances. You want to use your awareness to enable your tactics to improve your position so that you're in a very strong position relative to the adversary and skill almost doesn't even come into play because you have really easy shot, they have really hard shot, so you know, even if maybe you're kind of at parity with skill, you win. That's what you want, except you don't, can't always change the conditions. Uh, may not have the physical opportunity or may not have the time of opportunity to do that, and so you want the deep well of skill and attack the skill along with it. And ideally, you put, lean out from, the, you know, just to conjure up some, some situation, you lean out this much from the cover two inches and right in the eye, and you, you know, stop the threat right now. So there's, uh, you want the skill and you want the tactics. You want to have both. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And all these things that are the front end for the tactical stuff, you will discuss all this in more detail in your classes? Well, I do training in a couple of venues. So uh, I work for a sheriff's office in Oregon where we have a publicly available defensive handgun program that is not just a concealed carry class, but a whole comprehensive uh, training program that's at the Public Safety Training Center uh, in Clackamas, Oregon, uh, with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office, and uh, it's it's a wonderful program. It's great. I'm so incredibly awesome. fortunate to be there. Uh, that so that's their program, and I am very fortunate to have the position of being the public range training specialist there. So I teach uh, most, uh, not all, but most of the publicly available classes. They're all the intermediate and advanced ones, and uh, that's where we do that foundational training. And so that is very frankly resembles the tactical training that we all know and love. You know, good quality, excellent, high-level, good tactical training. Uh, and it has to start with the foundation. And at some point, at some point, you have the basics covered. Mindset, tactics, skills. And then it's time to sharp, to, if you want to keep going, it is time to start sharpening those things. One of the deepest directions that you can go because it's so accessible and reasonably easy to measure is technical performance. And if we made a list, you know, of, of all the things that what could a hypothetical, excellent, really powerfully uh, competent and skilled defensive handgun practitioner have, experience would be extremely high on the list. Yeah. However, that's a largely a moot point because for many of us, if you know, if if our role is as private citizens is spot problems coming far enough away that we can solve it by I'm out of here, then you're never going to accumulate experience, right? If that goes right, you're never, and even if it doesn't go right, you're going to get some little tiny hit. It's not going to be in a massive accumulation of, well, I've been in, you know, three dozen gunfights. It's not, not the way it's going to work. And uh, so given that we're not going to have experience, we need to make sure that we have all the other things that we can have and like a lot of them. And one of the things we can do is if we can't be experienced, at least we can be really good. We can simulate experience with it, like writing. Yes, there's a lots of facsimiles of experience that you can you can also gather into that too. Absolutely. So, how did this program start with the sheriff's office? Like, it, the program was already there, and you joined them. Yes, that's correct. So the, the facility already existed. They were already running the program. I actually went there as a student uh, mm -hmm. at, in. Uh, this is maybe about 2006 or so, uh, and and uh, went through the, the program there. And a, a, as it works in a lot of the tactical training world, you know, if you're a diligent student, you do well, you go, you keep going to classes, you keep trying and doing well, and have a have a command of the material and able to to demonstrate capability as they have taught it to you, uh, you're going to get abducted to be a volunteer instructor with them. Is what's going to happen. They're gonna, they're, you're going to come and help with the classes, unless you're not willing to do it. But that's where you're going. And uh, and and over time, you just kind of advance and uh, eventually I became, they, they hired me as an employee and then I was uh, a part-time instructor there and assisted with the existing classes, kind of went through a dual apprenticeship period uh, with them and also uh, Oregon Firearms Academy, that's another great school in Oregon that actually they've, they've retired, or at least semi-retired and closed down now, but I was an instructor there as well and that's where I kind of did a dual apprenticeship uh, at the PSTC and OFA and uh, uh, worked with very experienced firearms instructor who had a lot of operational experience, and it, it, it's very important to lean on that bedrock of experience because that kind of defines what we need to do in the in the in the practice environment, in the training environment, and uh, and and learn learn under them and 
you know, eventually became lead of the basic classes and then lead of the other classes too. And uh, recently, in la last fall, I was finally able to uh, get a full-time position there, and so that's what I do now. I work at the range and teach, and then I also go around and teach nationally. So to get back to your actual question, of, so I talk about this in my classes, uh, the things that we're talking about now are things that are more the subject matter of the foundational training, uh, foundational classes, and that, those will be the ones that you find at the Public Safety Training Center. Uh, my own class that's separate from the Sheriff's Office, and I go out and teach nationally, is called Pistol Shooting Solutions, and uh, that's probably what I'm more known on the internet for, I think. And uh, that is actually, a, a, I call it an intermediate slash advanced class because you can at least get productively started with it at the intermediate, what I'm going to call the intermediate level. So you've got a, you know, the basic foundation of defensive handgun skills and tactics in place. And now where can we go from here? That person with at least several days of training, they can get started in that class. But my hope is also that it is a deep enough class that even very, very uh, experienced people, whether experienced in training or real life or both, uh, those are really the, the big standouts that when, they, when they come to class. Uh, the, the class still has something for them, too. And it's been very, very, very gratifying that thus far it seems like they, they have found value there. That is really cool. Protect and serve, CCW, you guys listening to this? So I don't usually go to classes. Uh, I've been to like one or two defensive classes, but I think I just got sold. <laughs> um, um, I will need to get links from you. And uh, yeah. if I got the links, they're down there. He's posted on YouTube. This is probably posted on YouTube. So down there in the description, all the. Um, is it uh, how expensive is the the one with the sheriff's office? Well, our it's kind of a balance, balanced and interesting way. So uh, as an indoor range, it's very common for an indoor range. You have to buy the ammo from the range, which costs a little more than it's not the same price that you bought it off the internet. It's not it's not like a horrendous price, and the tuition is. The tuition is a little, is a pretty significantly below market value. Mm -hmm. So you kind of pay less for tuition, but more for ammo, and it balances out to it's pretty much the market price. So, so by the time you, by the time it's all said and done, you're going to spend something like, you know, five hundred bucks on a class between the tuition and the ammo. And like it's one day class. Well, no, no, that's that would be like a two day class. The one day classes are, two day class? you know, about a hundred, about hundred and sixty bucks plus, um, plus a significantly smaller amount of ammo. And you're teaching that. Mm -hmm. Five hundred bucks for for two days where people like gave teaching? That's like a steal. That's a steal. I mean, the um, what's the name of this call? Uh, technical response is five hundred bucks plus your own ammo. Um, so it's actually already more expensive for two days handgun. And I wasn't fortunate enough, and I didn't see it, and I tried to defend him, but it was real when uh, the instructor jumped on his pistol that was laying on the gravel and then discharged. Into the tire. You guys <laughs> Those are kind of rough stuff. estimates on my part. I hope I'm not misquoting any of the any of the prices because it kind of depends on what caliber you're shooting. But but you know something like that, five six hundred bucks, and it's, it's you know said and done there. That's good. That's good. I'm I'm sold definitely. So yeah. links cool. below. Okay. Um, we wanted to do the feels, but it's kind of it, it kind of was all the reels. Um, okay. So I, I, I guess this this is a fair question. What's your experience with violence in real life? Uh, very little or none. Uh, I have, uh, from the time I've been a little kid, I've always been interested in martial arts and self-defense because I recognize, you know, I mean, look at me, I'm not, I'm not being strong, mean. There's always somebody bigger, stronger, meaner. The big fish eat the little fish. It's the way of, it's the way of, it's the way of nature. It's the way of life. It's the way of the universe. And I have always felt like if I didn't attend to this skill set, I would be extremely sorely lacking in it. And so I am not a professional. I have never been a professional. Uh, and so I have been fortunate to see it coming far enough away that I'm out of here. And that's as far as it gets. And uh, after living in the, uh, you know, the city of Portland, Oregon for about, shoot, about 15 years now, uh, I have a, you know, small handful of rather anticlimactic stories I could tell that all resemble something didn't look good and I saw it. So I went away and it never got to me. It could have been a lot worse if I didn't manage it at the front end, or maybe they wouldn't have been. Don't know. And that's that's what's good, is I don't know. So it's all tactical TVs. That guy can put uh, two in the head box at seven yards. What's the turbo pin plus? Well, the turbo pin time like in class uh, is, no, 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 it's, it's, it's actually a pretty bit. Quite a bit uh, more generous than that, so two seconds uh, adjust the time for that. But you did like one seven four or something. Well, it, it, that that would be a probably a fairly typical time. Something like one five to two seconds is pretty typical for me. 
in a class demo, which is one of the two most stressful circumstances I shoot in. Class demo for score and uh, and competitive shooting, right? So uh, that would be typical for that. And then in and and uh, then in practice, you know, I'm more like one two to one four for that. But see, that's I think a big part of the puzzle, though, because if you, that that this is part of, this is a big part of the argument for getting a deep well of technical skill, because if you expect to perform at this level when everything becomes harder, then my my opinion at this point is so what you should do is train to way up here so that when everything sucks and your lips hurt real bad and you gotta pee and if you're under stress and you tumble down the mountain that you're still better on your worst day than the other guy ever dreamed of being on his best day. That is the mismatch you want to manufacture. Damn, but still, even under stress, like 1-7. Most of you guys can't even draw at 7 yards in the <laughs> upper alpha, and not in the head. And hey, he does 2 in the head. Man, I know how hard I had to work to get a 1.5 second drawn first shot just to a big A zone at 7 yards from concealment with any form of regularity. I know how much I had to struggle with that to, to make it past that. And look how much further I've come since then. Uh, so it, it's, uh, I think one of the most powerful things that you can do is the, the strategy that I've used to improve my technical skills really boils down to this. Identify people with the highest, uh, highest discernible performance levels, attempt to copy them and extend from there. Now I'm still trying to copy them, but what I would avoid doing is giving much, giving very much allowance for different gear or saying, well, but I'm shooting from concealment or I'm shooting a pretty close to stock gun and oh gosh, all those M's and GM's in limited are shooting race guns, which they are. And what you need to do about that, that, that that's all an editorial observation that is neither here nor there. The personal policy needs to be, I don't care, try anyway. Yep. Try anyway. Just throw off the yoke. Just do it. Throw off. No. Throw off. Yeah. Throw off the, low, the the yoke of low expectations and 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 attack it and see how far you can get. So you didn't have experience with violence. What put your mind like? What moved you to this idea of self preservation? Like there must be something that gave you the information. No. Like you're just smart from the start. Uh, no. Look out the window. It's self evident. It's it's it, to me it's, it's self evident. Okay, we just lost all all our uh, liberal base. Boom! All anti gunners just gone. I'm I'm a liberal, by the way. There's another link there. I I'm documented liberal, so guys, shut up. I'm not I'm not talking shit about anyone. I'm just saying that. Uh, accept the truth. Violence is a part of the human nature. Yes? No? I suppose it it, it must be. It <laughs> seems like it. it. Seems to be pretty uh, pretty strongly recurring, doesn't it, in the human experience? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I live in a good neighborhood. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, I mean, at this point, it's, it, I think one of the insidious things at this point is that it's really easy to kid yourself about violence because it doesn't regularly confront everybody all the time. It's really easy to go about your life and roll the dice. Hey, your chances many, are good. many of the people who roll the dice doing absolutely nothing to secure their own physical safety end up winning. Uh, winning as in as in they won the, the, they don't the, the probability the violence. Violence, they're not subjected to violence and it's fine. But it's also not quite like you know being struck by lightning. I think that Tom Gibbons' uh, arguments that, it, that there's a very real chance statistically across the lifetime of being a victim or attempted victim of a major crime like you know murder, aggravated assault, armed robbery, sexual assault, something like that, you know, a ma major violent crime that accumulated over the life. And there's a very real risk of that. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Lots of people will get through their life and it will not happen at all. So it's really easy to kick yourself. But the, the flip side is it's going to happen to a, a pretty significant number of people that, that it also is. So. All right. So uh, what else? What else can we talk about? <laughs> we're, we're trying to get the feels and, and not get all nerdy and stuff. Uh, okay. Gun culture, FUDs, tactical teamies. Um, so, do you know the concept of gun culture 1.0, 2.0? At least vaguely, yeah. How about 3.0? Yeah, I think that's where we're going. That's 3.0 right there. <laughs> so, here's, here's my very vague idea. Gun culture 1.0 is basically your FUDs. Shotguns, um, hunting, stuff like that. Gun culture 2.0 People who start thinking more about self-defense, so it's a little bit newer generation, probably starting with boomers, uh, they may start going into guns because of self-defense. Uh, tactical teams are there, all the tactical bros, muscular culture is there. But it's not performant yet, it's not uh, really focused on 
gun culture or, or the things surrounding as a, as a kung fu or as a, as a martial art. And then there's gun culture that emerges 3.0 where people actually start trying to compare themselves and actually practice the thing as a martial art. Martial art. What do you think? I, I think that's pretty accurate. That's, that's roughly how I, yeah, I have no disagreement there. I pretty much feel that way about it. And I think there's a, for that third group um, that you mentioned, I, I think there's an important maturing process that also goes on there. It's very easy to get very wrapped up in the numbers because they're so easy to, they're relatively speaking, easy to measure. Tactics, awareness, those things are much harder to measure yeah. and require a lot more subjective judgment and some you know experience frame of reference to kind of be the bedrock guide for it. But it's easy to measure hits in time. And so it's, it's, uh, it's something that you can become very wrapped up in and to an extent. I think there has, there, there may be... You know, maybe there has to be a period where a person does that because that's a big driver for performance and that is ultimately what it is all about. But there is also, uh, ultimately, you know, to me, the answer comes back full circle to you know the fundamental answer that you, know, you get taught in all the, the, the tactical training, which is correct, but at the end of the day, it is about making the hit under the conditions imposed upon you. This is what you have. Here, now, make the hit. This is what you got. But the real task is, once it comes to that point, is just make the hit. Uh, it's in sharpening what that product will ultimately be. That's where the that's I think where the the very numbers oriented practice comes in. So you know, there's perspective that you gain over time too. Would you be interested in uh, next generation of uh, shooting competitions that's based more on a force on force? Did you think about it? I haven't really considered a competition based on that because if you say competition force on force. To me, I would just look directly at an existing competitive force-on-force -force environment like they Okay, I guess it's I just, mean, it's there, just a question of gear now. Right, and, and there are lots of very so, so this is something we kind of talked about earlier, that you know all the different ways of training, ways of practicing, ways of testing, they all have some relevance to the puzzle. They all have their piece of the puzzle, whether it's a kind of big piece or maybe kind of a smaller piece or somewhere in between. They all have kind of a piece of the puzzle. And the concept of training scars, I think, is a, is a valid concept. The idea that, that you know, you, if you practice something that is represents reality unrealistically that you then go on to copy that and then it doesn't end up being a valid action or tactic or whatever it is uh, when it does come to reality. That, that is not wrong, but where that comes from more than anywhere else is when you practice or train or whatever it is that you do is the only thing you do. You do that exclusively. Don't do anything else uh, coming from any other direction. And so then the things that are not accurately represented, they just become a hole in your game. What you need to do is fill in those holes, shore up those weaknesses by coming at the problem from lots of different directions. So the fact that paintball is highly unrealistic in many ways, which is absolutely true, to me is neither here nor there. It's basically irrelevant. Uh, yes, that's true. And what you, but what is not unrealistic in paintball is the human dynamics of dealing with a real human being who is coming over here to shoot you, and he is not kidding. He is not being your buddy. It's not like martial arts class where it's like, all right, grab my wrist. No, the other wrist. No, my other wrist. No, the other way. Oh, okay, now I can do the defense. No, they're not cooperating. They're coming to shoot you, and you got to shoot them instead. And uh, and so the the uh, line of sight based dynamics, which are hugely powerful, the communicative element and the movement element is all brought crystallized and brought to the front in something like paintball. Uh, teaches you to use cover extremely well. Teaches because you leave that elbow sticking out two inches, it is getting shot like right away, and you're out of the game. So, uh, so however, it, on the flip side, it would teach you to identify cover extremely badly because everything is covered from a paintball and the things that are not covered from bullets, right? And uh, and there we just hit on another example. If you get shot, you are not out of the fight. Yeah, it is time to continue, right? Right, right. So there are all kinds of realistic and unrealistic things, but uh, to the to, to the to the the side of the coin that are the benefits, they're big, big, powerful benefits to something like that. What's the speed of the paintball ball? Uh, I haven't been in it for quite a while, but uh, generally three hundred feet per second, or sometimes a little less than that. So it's actually pretty fast. It's faster than airsoft. I'm not sure. I'm not real familiar with feet per second of airsoft, so I'm not sure. I mean, nine mil is like thousand. 1100, something like that. But it's a big ball that breaks, so it doesn't, you know, it, it like if, if you made a ball bearing go yeah. that speed and it had more mass and it didn't break on somebody, then, you know, it would shoot them, but it, it, <laughs> closer, it would be closer to that, right? But when it, you know, paintball breaks, it, 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 pain-wise, it's kind of like you get snapped with a towel. It's kind of like that. Yeah.
it's like a 50 cal or even bigger. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so we discussed this before, um, and you prefer paintball over airsoft as uh, as a piece of a puzzle for us, for like technical activities and training. So why would you say a paintball is better? So I, I, let me kind of calibrate that a little bit. So I think that for something like scenario training, decision-making training, airsoft would be much better because you're going to be able to use a projectile firing device. The gun is going to be much more realistic in that way, right? Um, what I'm getting at is the value of competition. Uh, that's one of the things that we have here in USPSA is that everybody is really trying to win. And so said they set the bar very high. In a competitive environment, it has to be fair. There are a lot of problems in paintball barely adjudicating did somebody get hit or not hit. When they airsoft pellet that doesn't even leave a paint mark. Yeah. I don't know how on earth they, they could, you could possibly create a worthwhile competitive airsoft environment. I mean, maybe it can be done and I'm just unaware of it, but given my experience in paintball, I don't know how that would work. And that's the reason that I, for the purpose of just a free form force on force, shoot each other environment where it's not couched within a context and involving tactical prioritized decision-making that I would go in the paintball direction. Now, you know, scenario training, no, we're not gonna have, you know, when they pull out the giant paintball gun and, you know, shoot the mugger at the fake ATM. No, that's not the way it's gonna work. We're gonna have airsoft guns for that or something. But, uh, but just for the purpose of get experience shooting and getting shot at and dealing with that situation, I think that, you know, the, the competition, the fact that it is a competition raises the bar of technical performance by a lot. When everybody is like, well, I just have a role to play. I'm just a dumb mugger, and I'm like going to kind of point my gun at you, and maybe if you don't start shooting me in about five seconds, maybe I'll get around to it. You know, it, it, these, these people in paintball, they're not playing along with you. They're coming to shoot you. So mindset, now. competitiveness, and aggressiveness. Yeah. Okay. That, that totally answers So you kind question. of get different things from them, I think. Nice. Um, we discussed this a little bit, uh, and you said you played PUBG? No, I didn't. I'm aware, I'm aware of its existence, that's all. And... Uh, Compared to, so if you have like a perfect video game that's like ideal for training, you know, <laughs> tactics and uh, aggressiveness and adversary uh, and stuff, um, how do you think it's going to compare to airsoft, paintball, uh, in terms of like just learning these things? Sure. So I think big downside of a first person, so let's just use category, first person shooting video games. Yes. I think that the big downside is... All the things you do are controlled by this stuff, not by you physically moving around and wielding a weapon and using it. All the skill is out of the window. Right, right. It's going to be more visual and mental training. Uh, I think one big pitfall of them uh, is contextual. So it needs to be considered like I've been talking about with paintball, where it's just a free-form, shoot-each-other environment devoid of any realistic context. It is not, I'm going to the store to buy a you know, jug of milk when this happens, you know, no, that's not it. It's just, we're just going to go have a big fight, a big gunfight. That's all. Uh, and get, and, and thus gain experience and hopefully uh, facsimile of experience and hopefully gain, uh, s sharpen our skills at that. I think that, uh, another thing that you get really got to watch out for with first, first person shooter video games is the artificial horizon, the lack of an artificial horizon line created by the hands and gun when you mount the gun. So when you aim a real gun, whether you got a dot or you got irons or whatever it is, if you mount the gun, you get it in front of your face to use the sights, or you mount the rifle to get it in front of your face to use the sights or use the dot, it creates an artificial horizon line here of your hands and, and by your hands and gun. It is different, depending on the situ exact situation, it is difficult or impossible, one or the other, it's difficult or impossible to see what's below that horizon line while you have the gun mounted. This creates a critical chain of observation to decision making to action that has to happen or you are at severe risk of catastrophic uh, problem, uh, bad outcome on uh, in a couple of different ways. You've got to have unobstructed vision to see and make a decision in the first place. And after you have made the decision, you can present the gun wherever that was coming from, whether it was the holster, previous target, ready position, whatever that is. But you've got to start out with unobstructed vision. Make a fast and accurate decision, because fast and accurate, not just about shooting, also about decision making. Then carry out this, the, whatever that decision was. And if we're talking about the, this decision was to shoot, then you're going to mount the gun, necessarily creating that artificial horizon line, because in order to responsibly and effectively stop the threat, then you're going to need to mount the gun to shoot well. That, that probably was outside of contact. That's probably what's going to need to happen. Uh, so 
that's an issue with a lot of first-person shooter video games because they use the crosshair model. There's a crosshair in the center of the screen, and you have no artificial horizon line. And those that use uh, aim down sights is a little bit better. In this I, I do think it's better. It's still not perfect, but it's better. Better, yeah. Because the hands are just too low. Right. Your hands are kind of like obscuring a lot right. of stuff. Right, right. Uh, so those those altitude changes that a human being can make. I mean, even we're not even talking about them like getting up on a structure or something, but just people standing on the ground. They can be standing. They can be somewhat lower. They can be balled up all the way down on the ground. When you're looking for them, you have to have unobstructed vision all the way down there, or you may not locate them. It may be that the first thing you know as you're on the sites too early is whack whack whack. First thing you know is you're shot because they got some free shots at you because they could see you and you were prematurely aiming prior to having found and decided to engage. Yeah, this is going to sound really stupid to you guys, but um, old, uh, old series of games called Fallout, there was a third one, uh, Fallout Tactics, and what they introduced is they introduced different positions, prone, uh, on uh, kneeling, and, and standing. And in modern games, uh, the, the shooters, they have the same thing. And I always thought it was like a tactical thing, just, you know, to simulate stuff. It actually helps. If you go prone in grass, they don't see you. If you go prone in the room, they come in, they don't see you. You just shoot them for free. That's, that's so, so you've experienced that in that game? I experienced yeah. that in that so, game. And, and you tell me, now, how powerful was that? When, when they don't have that, when they don't, don't have it practiced and trained with, in accordance with that, yeah. and you're all set up down low, and they walk in, pre-aiming, you get free shots. You get at least one free shot, probably a free burst. Yeah, so how PUBG works is you have a circle that's closing, and it's a big map. Uh, so the circle is there to just force players to move. And they have uh, more... It actually looks like East Oregon, by the way. <laughs> it really, one of the maps looks East Oregon 100%. And they have these little shacks that you can get into. And what I don't like about PUBG is everything is pretty much cover. Nothing is concealment. So stuff that you can shoot through in real life. In PUBG, it's like a concrete wall that 50 will not go through. But yeah, basically, you go into the shack. You're first there. You lay down. You wait for the second guy. You hear the steps. He comes in, guy down high, clear. And you already shot him. He's dead. The, the big caveat I would give there is that when we're talking about very close ranges, so not like yes. military engagement measures in hundreds of yards, um, the loss of mobility of going all the way down, like especially a, any sort of traditional prone position, that's a big problem. And you probably want to probably want to cultivate some alter, alternate positions, some squatting, kneeling, having as many feet flat on the ground as you can position. Some of those ninja kick positions can work similarly to prone, but you could get out, you can stand up out of them very quickly. Yes. And I think those things are better. So just, just, just kind of the caveat of if distance is pretty close, I would not want to go prone specifically. Other yeah, than that, absolutely. the altitude change of getting lower and getting under the, the frankly, it's a pretty pervasive thing. Uh, I know how hard you have to work in tactical training to get people to quit. Hey, get ready to shoot that guy. Okay. And they get on sights and get on trigger uh, early. And you got to get, get rid of that. You can't have on the trigger early. You're, all you're doing is courting negligent discharge. Yep. Uh, you can't be on the site even getting that out of there. Uh, you can't be on the sights early either because before you can shoot, you got to decide to shoot. Before you can deci decide to shoot, generally speaking, you must see someone. Most of the time, you have to see something that tells you it is now time to shoot. So uh, it is, you know, even having discussed it, getting people to actually do it is a whole order of magnitude, a whole nother step forward that you've got to do a lot of work on to get people to actually quit doing the wrong thing with pre-mounting the gun. And uh, so, you know, that takes it takes quite a bit of effort to get somebody out of that. And it's not the pre-aiming ahead of time, prematurely mounting the gun is not a universal behavior, but it's pretty darn pervasive and so rolling the dice on there's a good chance he's walking in aiming ahead of time there is a very good chance of that and so you know as a strategy uh, going for lower altitude changes to exploit that that very pervasive error i think is a good bet yeah and talking about prone and just this game gives you three choices standing uh kneeling and prone in real life our controller is so much better you can lean against the wall you can hide yourself you can do all the ninja stuff that you can see, I don't know, somewhere there <laughs> on this channel. Um, we have a lot of controls. In games, it's like more like you're driving a tractor. So yeah, de definitely. Um, and this is what I think uh, is going to be cool for virtual reality, virtual reality later down the line when they will have controllers not only for hands, but also for like maybe positioning, maybe a suit basically with lamps. So the game will know where your, or tactical simulator, uh, will know where your body is 
precisely located. Uh, so that I think is going to be very cool stuff, but probably like 10 years later, <laughs> yeah. it costs money. Okay, uh, it's 2.46, it's, it's 1.46 already. Let's wrap this up, I guess. Do you have anything to add, just, just from yourself? Uh, not really. I, I think, I think uh, you know, so many different types of training for self-defense have a lot of value. And, uh, you know, here we are at shooting a big USPSA match. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, the technical bar is set so high, it is just really hard to not get your butt kicked by that. And, uh, you know, we, none of us ever shoot as well as we want to. But it's, uh, it's a cold, hard reality check of on-demand technical capability that despite all the uh, criticism that is sometimes leveled at USPSA, you know, quite honestly, I think it is uh, one of the most accessible uh, open, honest, competitive, on-demand shooting environments that exist, and is, is, is one of the ways to you know it's it's really hard to come be to come here and BS yourself because beep your turn and how you what you got is what you got and no you don't you don't get to go again because it didn't work out how you wanted and no you don't get to go again because your gun didn't work right you got your score and here it is and then later here it is listed publicly for everybody to see and all that adds a lot of stress. And it's, a, it's a, a, a way to shoot under some level of stress. Yeah, you guys at CCW always say when you, uh, when you strap on a gun and you leave your home, you have to leave your ego there. Well, come here, shoot use PSA. Your ego is going to be beaten, abused, and left on the side of the road dying. <laughs> you won't have to leave it at home. You like, won't have it anymore. That, there, there's maybe, no ego anymore. Maybe, it's, yeah. just, it's dead. Right. It's gone. <laughs> okay, so last two questions. Uh, what would you recommend or ask competitive shooters to do in regards to become more tactical team, more martial artists, more like us? Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, since I since I come from the defensive world, I didn't, haven't really thought about it much in that in those terms. Because one of the things that I have really valued about the competitive world is that you know what, if you come here and you're safe, and especially if you're safe, and also you know if you can shoot reasonably well. Nobody has any problem with what I'm doing. I mean, I, you know, you and I shoot this a different way than, than almost everybody in USPSA does, and they don't care. We can have a come and come and have a place at the table with everybody else, and it's perfectly fine. Uh, so, what could gamers, quote unquote, do? You know, I think it depends on the person, because the fact is that there are uh, there is a wide variety of of people in competitive shooting. Many of them are experienced in the real world. Many of them are have have been through tactical training. Some of them have not. So you know, if a person carries a gun for self defense, I would get that stuff. I think even even though you may well be worlds beyond the technical demands of that foundational level of defensive training, there's a lot of other stuff that's are that are important parts of the puzzle. You should know you should know the law. You should know uh, judicious use of deadly force principles, criteria for justified use of deadly force against other people, and there's a whole litany of foundational tactical things that would be really good for you to know if you didn't have that stuff. And the other, the only other thing I would say is if, if somebody comes here and can throw down at some very, very high skill level, you know, again, everybody's different. Lots of USPSA shooters do carry a gun out there in the world, but I wish that everyone would. Uh, because, the, you know, if you've got that level of skill, like comes with any significant amount of, of USPSA participation and practice for it, I I don't know how you don't want to walk around with that still available to you. I mean, if I were like a world champion harmonica player, I would never not have a harmonica in my pocket. You, you would always have, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you? So a handgun, you could carry a handgun around all the time. So if you're really good, and even if you weren't, if you were really pretty good, I mean, how would you not want to be able to have that capability if the time came? It reminds me of an uh, episode someone told me about the... Uh, I don't watch Game of Thrones. I never watched it. But there was this episode in Game of Thrones where uh, someone was talking about fencing and someone's teacher was the greatest uh, sword man of whatever. And he died because he didn't carry a sword. And the guy <laughs> yeah, was like... And the guy's like a thug or whatever. And he's like, a best swordsman of your country... Did not carry a sword. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, same that, concept. That 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 makes it for competitive guys. <laughs> uh, what about tactical teamies who are who think that we're gonna get killed in the streets? What what do you want to say to them? Just don't expect competition to represent tactics well, because that's not what it's about. It's a technical skills contest. End of story. That's that's it. Is it, 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 back to the different things have different pieces of the puzzle. What competitive shooting does not have is tactics. 
unless except of course the tactic is total aggression but even then it still doesn't apply i mean what you know are you really going to have like you know 12 guys that don't move and you know six of them are all you know have hostages because you know the way they st stack the targets in uspsa so it's it, you know it's just not going to be unrealistic what it is going to be is really hard really 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 hard it's going to be that and you're going to be up against a whole bunch of really, really good people. And you won't be able to BS yourself about what your actual capability was. Beep! When it was your turn. Yep. That's what you get from it. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, doing this interview. I hope I don't, uh, I didn't delay you for too much. No, no. Thanks so much for your interest in, and, and talking with me. Thanks so yep. much, Steph. Thank you, sir. And uh, that was Gabe White, guys. You should totally uh, check out his YouTube uh, and get his training. And... Uh, I guess that's it. Get you some! <laughs> <laughs>